Due to the graphic nature of this cult's crimes, listener discretion is advised. This episode includes discussions of graphic material that some people may find offensive. We advise extreme caution for listeners under 13. As a boy, John Humphrey Noyes had every material advantage he could dream of. But as a young man, he turned his back on worldly things to found the longest-running utopian community of the 19th century, the Oneida community. Initially shy around women, Noyes developed an entire theology grounded in the idea that every man in his group was married to every woman, and every woman to every man. But Noyes utilized his role as leader of this seemingly egalitarian community to sleep with girls as young as 11, experiment with eugenics, and possibly even engage in incest. Hi, I'm Greg Polson. And I'm Vanessa Richardson. And this is Cults. This is part one of our exploration into John Humphrey Noyes and his late 19th century utopian experiment, the Oneida community. The community name was popularized after Noyes' death when the newly capitalist organization began stamping it into their plated silver flatware made for mass market. If you want to listen to any previous episodes of Cults, you can find them on your favorite podcast directory or on our website, parcast.com. And don't forget to subscribe while you're there because a new episode comes out every Tuesday. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram at Parcast and on Twitter at Parcast Network. If you like what you hear, please leave a five-star review wherever you're listening. Noyes founded the Oneida community in Oneida, New York in 1848 and gathered 300 followers at the cult's peak. The group believed in Noyes' particular brand of Christian perfectionism, which essentially meant that they believed they could be without sin. The purpose of Noyes' community was to build a kingdom of God on earth. After Noyes fled to Canada to avoid legal action against him in 1879, his community fell apart. The Oneida community broke from communal living in 1881, splitting the common property among its members. While Oneida Limited still exists as a company, they've intentionally distanced themselves from the more radical aspects of Noyes' great experiment. In this episode, we'll explore the early life of the unusual religious thinker, John Humphrey Noyes. We'll uncover how the boy who was painfully awkward around girls instituted a social system that enabled him to have sex with hundreds of women. We'll look into Noyes' religious upbringing and the religious concepts he manipulated to build the social structure of his commune. In part two, we'll explore the rise of the Oneida community itself. We'll delve deep into Noyes' most confounding legacy, complex marriage, the social system in which every community man was married to every woman and every woman to every man. We'll also investigate how Noyes became obsessed with eugenics and incest, and how he may have even sired children with his own female relatives. John Humphrey Noyes' father, John Noyes, was born into a colonial family in Atkinson, Massachusetts in 1764. He was an educated man and used a $600 inheritance to study at Dartmouth College. In today's money, his tuition cost $15,000. The elder John Noyes graduated with honors and went on to teach. He abandoned teaching for the ministry, but soon changed his mind about the ministry as well. Now, before Vanessa dives into the psychology, we want to give you a brief disclaimer. Vanessa isn't a licensed psychologist or psychiatrist, but she's done extensive research for this show. Thanks, Greg. John Noyes apparently quit his first professions because of a family malady that the Noyeses referred to as the Atkinson Difficulty. The Noyeses named their family mental illness after their hometown of Atkinson, Massachusetts, but Noyes' predisposition certainly wasn't the town's fault. Atkinson difficulty described the family's tendency toward debilitating shyness. They're believed to have suffered from what we now call social anxiety disorder, or SAD, which can have a genetic component. 
The DSM-5 describes SAD as, quote, a persistent fear of one or more social performance situations in which the person is exposed to unfamiliar people or possible scrutiny by others. The individual fears that they will embarrass or humiliate themselves, end quote. Many scholars think the elder John Noyes abandoned teaching and preaching because of SAD, but he committed himself to overcoming his social anxiety. He went into business in Brattleboro, Vermont. Confidence came with his growing professional success, and he even became a sought-after storyteller at the tavern where he lived. John met Polly Hayes, the tavern keeper's highly religious daughter, when he was 36, and she was just 19. However, it wasn't uncommon at the beginning of the 1800s for men to marry much younger women. Polly was taken with the educated John's knowledge of science, morality, and philosophy, and eventually the two married. The couple flourished in the economically prosperous town of Brattleboro, and they had three daughters. But Polly fell into an acute depression. She was possessed by the idea that she was going to die and leave any children she had to grow up alone. She prayed and prayed until she finally felt God had told her that she had work to accomplish on earth. This helped Polly break out of her depression. Soon her fog lifted and she realized she was pregnant. Polly was gripped with what she described as, quote, a state of high religious joy, end quote. According to a study cited by Dr. Anna Glazer, up to 20% of women who have recently given birth display symptoms of a condition known as hypomania. These women may feel more energetic and they seemingly don't need much sleep. But while hypomania may not seem like a bad thing, Dr. Joseph Goldberg warns that hypomania can transform into actual mania. Unlike hypomania, symptoms of mania can include both hallucinations and delusions. We don't know if Polly had the symptoms of hypomania, but it's clear that Noyes' birth dramatically affected her mood. In 1811, her husband John Noyes was elected as a representative to the Vermont State Legislature. Their firstborn son, little red-haired John Humphrey Noyes, arrived a few months later on September 3, 1811, in Brattleboro, Vermont. At the time, the whole country was gripped by the Second Great Awakening, a Protestant religious movement. The movement drew people back to church, who had been rattled by social changes brought on by the Industrial Revolution. Many people were looking for a better way to live, and joined utopian communities, where they could create their own rules to live by. Noyes' parents each embodied key aspects of his future cult. His father was a successful businessman, while his mother was passionately religious. The elder John Noyes profited immensely from the War of 1812, and he traveled frequently in his capacity as a Vermont legislator, which meant Polly, who was a devoted Calvinist, pretty much raised the kids alone. It's widely accepted that Polly was particularly invested in the development and future of John Humphrey Noyes. He was not only the first son, but he also carried the weight of having inadvertently pulled Polly out of her depression when he was born. In Susan Adams Dubay's writings about Noyes' early life, she describes Polly's and Noyes' mother-son relationship as uniquely, quote, emotionally entangled in a way that was not common much before mid-century, end quote. In other words, Noyes was very close to his mother for a boy growing up in the early 1800s, but their closeness didn't stop Polly from running a strict Calvinist household. Dubay writes, quote, The chances are good that Noyes was subjected to a great deal of shaming as a small child, since his mother was a Calvinist, she probably adhered to child-rearing practices which were intended to prevent the growth of autonomy in young children and to break their wills. Many Calvinist parents intended to instill a lifelong sense of shame in their children in hopes of ensuring their salvation." End quote. This may seem contradictory given the strong bond between Polly and young noise, However, Polly firmly believed she was doing what was best for her children by teaching them to live according to Calvinist doctrine. But according to Dr. Bacho, a professor at Lemoyne College, parental shaming can actually backfire and seriously undermine a child's confidence. This, in turn, can potentially contribute to a child's symptoms of depression and anxiety. 
Noyce's younger brother, George, was born in 1813, when Noyce was two years old. Dubé suspects that two-year-old Noyce was not pleased to have a baby brother. He was accustomed to his mother's attention. When George was born, Polly's attention shifted to her newborn. This left Noyce feeling abandoned. When Noyce was three, he fell into a scalding hot vat of clothes that Polly was in the process of washing. He suffered serious burns and was bedridden for weeks. It was an incredibly traumatizing experience for the toddler. The Noyce's wealth didn't insulate them from psychological complications. Polly and John Noyes Sr. each suffered from anxiety and depression at one time or another, and when the elder Noyes came home from serving a year in the House of Representatives in 1815, he was addicted to booze. The family's instability may account for reports that the younger Noyes got violent and hostile under pressure during primary school. In 1817, when Noyes was seven, his father retired from political life and the family decided to move from Brattleboro to Dummerston, Vermont. A year later, in 1818, Polly took eight-year-old Noyes to a camp revival in nearby Putney. These revivals were designed to help people have spiritual awakenings or conversions. Young Noyes had his first significant spiritual experience. This kind of conversion shouldn't be confused with the modern idea of converting from one faith to another. It was about having a visceral and personal experience of connection to God that exceeded simply going to church. The evangelists were gunning to bring in young congregants, but even the evangelists thought that Noyes was too young to have a real conversion experience. Nevertheless, Polly was thrilled by her son's growing connection with God. A year later, in 1819, nine-year-old Noyes was sent to boarding school at Amherst. It was a terrible experience for the shy boy. Here's part of one of his letters home. He wrote, quote, I've been pretty contented since you left me, except that last evening I was rather inclined to be homesick. I sat in my chamber alone. The wind whistled around the house. I began to think of home, and I became sad, end quote. Noyce goes on to describe trying to distract himself with the activities of school, and then continues, quote, Mama, I must say when I am not reading or writing or studying, I am homesick. Yes, I am homesick. But away with all this. I fear I have distressed you already. Tell Papa that I am studying Cicero and that I have got to the fourth book of Virgil, end quote. The homesickness is completely understandable, and the nine-year-old's desire to spare his mom from worrying shows how concerned he was for her well-being. It's yet another indicator of their close bond. Noyce didn't have to remain homesick for long. Polly's and her husband's concern for their children's education led them to consider another move. But the couple disputed the most advantageous new location. They first considered Amherst, but neither wanted to move there. John, who'd enjoyed aspects of his time in the relatively cosmopolitan D.C., favored bustling New Haven. Polly, on the other hand, wanted to make a decision in the best interests of their children's religious development. She prayed for three months and eventually settled on Putney. Putney was familiar, but the chief selling point was the town's reputation as a frequent host of revivals, including the one Noyes attended when he was eight. Once his father retired in 1821, the whole family moved to Putney when Noyes was 10. Noyes left school in Amherst for Brattleboro Academy, which was much closer to home. The passionate, red-headed Noyes finished his primary education at Brattleboro in 1826 when he was 15. His father wanted him to continue his education at Yale, but his mother thought his father's alma mater, Dartmouth, would be better for him spiritually. So Noyes followed his mother's advice and attended Dartmouth. Young Noyes excelled in academics and was praised by his instructors. He wasn't a braggart, though. He believed pride was a sin, and he was still painfully shy. But he must have shared his desires with schoolmates, because one of Noyes' buddies described him as, quote, inclined to give way a little too much to the libido corporis, end quote, or physical lust. Noyes claimed he was a virgin until he married, but his diary entries are littered with evidence of his intense preoccupation with women. 
His diaries also expose his crushing self-doubt. Noyes was convinced that his red hair and freckles would thwart his search for a mate. Recent studies have shown that the majority of red-haired people have experienced bullying at some point for the color of their hair, so it's possible that Noyes' fears about his looks sprang from personal experiences. In Ellen Wayland Smith's book, Oneida, From Free Love Utopia to the Well-Set Table, she writes, quote, John Humphrey compared himself to the Black Dwarf in the Walter Scott romance of the same name, a tortured, loveless figure whose deformed body and long, matted red hair forced him to sequester himself in the forest as a hermit. She goes on to write, quote, The young collegian's interactions with women were, accordingly, nothing short of torture, end quote. Noyes also revealed his shyness and fear of women in another diary entry, writing, quote, Oh, for a brazen front and nerves of steel, I swear by Jove I will be impudent. So unreasonable and excessive is my bashfulness that I fully believe I could face a battery of cannon with less trepidation than I could a room full of ladies with whom I was unacquainted, end quote. Fortunately for Noyes, this wasn't a problem he had to deal with at school. Dartmouth didn't accept women until 1972. Many of the Dartmouth students in Noyes' time came from local farms. They wanted to prepare for careers in business, since the U.S. was moving away from an agrarian way of life. But unlike Noyes, his fellow students juggled work and college. While Noyes had nothing to distract him from his studies, these young men were frequently punished by the school for their work-related absences. It was the most pronounced class difference Noyes had seen in his life, and perhaps this influenced his later interest in communal living and resource sharing. After graduating from Dartmouth in 1829, Noyes moved to Chesterfield, New Hampshire, where he trained to be a lawyer at his brother-in-law's firm, Larkin Meads. In Chesterfield, Noyes was one of only two college grads in his social circle. This boosted his confidence with women, but didn't cure him of his self-doubt. After he moved to Chesterfield in 1829, Noyes fell for a young woman named Caroline. He considered asking her to marry him, but he was paralyzed with fear and couldn't bring himself to open up to her. When his apprenticeship at the law firm was over, Noyes rushed back to Putney without even saying goodbye. And this wouldn't be the last time that Noyes fled under pressure. In spite of Noyes' dedication to his legal studies, his first appearance in front of a judge was an unmitigated disaster. He wrote, quote, I was frightened beyond all reasonable bounds. I stammered and trembled, and for a few minutes was utterly unable to fabricate a decent concatenation of words. The conclusion of the whole matter is that in the taunting words of Squire Spalding, I did not plead worth a damn, end quote. By 1831, Noyes was 19 and a trained lawyer, but he was living in Putney with his family, crushed by failure. It soon became clear that Noyes was plagued with psychosomatic illnesses that lined up with his bouts of depression and anxiety. His behavior started to trouble his family and friends, who were worried about his inability to function. But Noyes remained rudderless and in and out of bed with various ailments. In an effort to please his mother, Noyes decided to attend a four-day revival in Putney in August of 1831. Unlike Noyes' first uneventful revival experience, this revival ultimately changed Noyes' life forever. Now it's time for a quick break. It's time to talk about getting away. The high-quality luggage that's designed to be resilient, resourceful, and essential to the way you travel. Their suitcases come in a variety of colors and four sizes, including carry-on sizes that are compliant with all major U.S. airlines. I have the regular carry-on, and it's the greatest suitcase. It has a TSA-approved combination lock, four 360-degree spinner wheels, and a patent-pending compression system to help over packers. It's like they made it just for me. My favorite thing about a Way carry-on is that it comes with a removable battery underneath the handle that's compliant with all airline policies and TSA approved. I can charge anything that's powered by a USB cord. This suitcase is a game changer. For $20 off a suitcase, visit awaytravel.com slash cults and use promo code cults during checkout. 
That's awaytravel.com slash cults and promo code cults for $20 off your away suitcase. And now for something more adorable. Bringing home a new puppy is a joyous moment you will never forget. But how can you be sure it came from a responsible breeder? If you want a trusted service that connects the nation's top breeders to caring, responsible individuals and families, you should check out PuppySpot.com. PuppySpot is more than a service. They're advocates. They only accept the highest level of licensed breeders into their exclusive community. But most of all, they're dog lovers, just like you. So if you're not sure what breed to get, if you have small kids, or if you need a hypoallergenic breed, talk to their puppy concierge service. It's devoted to helping you find the right breed for you. Fetch your new best friend at puppyspot.com slash cults. And for a limited time, get access to the Puppy Spot VIP program with discounts on everything you need for your new puppy, from food to walking services. Go to puppyspot.com slash cults for this special offer. That's puppyspot.com slash cults. Now, let's get back to the story. After attending the 1831 revival in Putney, John Humphrey Noyes came home despondent. He'd seen others enraptured by God, but he didn't feel anything like his previous conversion. He wrote in his diary, quote, In the afternoon, I was almost sick with a cold and stayed at home. I took medicine and went to bed. And when the house was empty and all still, the thought came suddenly and forcibly into my mind that I never should have a more favorable time for submitting to God. The severity of my cold suggested to me the idea of the uncertainty of life. I then, after some hard thinking, determined to obtain religion and immediately set about conquering my pride." End quote. Noyes spent two days poring over the Bible. It was the only thing that he found calming, but he couldn't find peace of mind. He was terrified that he'd never truly find God and that he'd be damned for all eternity. He went to an older convert for mentorship. The man told Noyes that what he was expressing was actually a sign that he'd already had a deep conversion experience. That really struck a nerve with Noyes. He was thrilled at the prospect of dedicating his life to God. Within a month, he started school at Andover, where he studied to become a minister. But though Noyes may have escaped the stresses of a career in law, he couldn't escape his mental health struggles. During his time at Andover, Noyes wrote in his diary that his mind, quote, seemed to lose its faculty of self-control. My physical system sank under the intensity, end quote. He tried to find something to ground him in student life and joined a club for students interested in going on international missions. In order to assist each other in spiritual purification, students frequently made a member stand in front of the group. Then the cohort would point out character flaws, the idea being that they could help each other know how to improve themselves. But this group shaming tactic had negative consequences for Noy's mental health. According to Dr. Bacho, quote, when shame is internalized and becomes pervasive and enduring, a person can be at risk for developing unhealthy conditions such as depression or social anxiety disorder, end quote. Unable to get a handle on his social anxiety, Noyes hit a breaking point after six months and fled home. He spent a month recovering from a combination of mental and physical illnesses before he went back to Andover to scrape through the rest of the year. While Noyes was at Andover, he developed his own way of studying the Bible. He focused on some issue that was bothering him, and then scoured the Gospels for anything that could provide guidance. Unsatisfied with the religious education he was receiving at Andover, Noyes thought about transferring to Yale, where a radical teacher named Dr. Nathaniel Taylor was lecturing. Dr. Taylor proposed a theology that blended Calvinist ideals with some of the more liberal religious ideals that were spreading with the revival movement. Noyes wasn't sure whether he should stay at Andover or transfer to Yale, so he engaged in a superstitious technique. He asked God a question, then opened the Bible and read the first thing he saw on the page in order to find an answer. Noyes described the result in his diary, quote, whether it was by chance, I will not say. But the passage that my eyes first fell upon was Matthew 28, 5, 6. Fear not ye, 
For I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here. I could not but be amused at the coincidence of the passage with the facts of the case. I see no reason why I should be ashamed to confess that this little circumstance broke the equilibrium of my doubts and settled my determination to go." End quote. So he went to Yale, in spite of his worry that his mother wouldn't like Dr. Taylor's radical views, but he had a crafty way of diverting any blame. Noyes claimed to his parents that since he found the answer to the question of which school to attend in the Bible, God had chosen for him. Noyes attended Yale where Dr. Taylor taught him how to successfully debate matters of religion. But Noyes didn't just excel at his schoolwork. He also became more social. In the winter of 1832, he even helped form the Anti-Slavery Society in New Haven. And he joined the New Haven Free Church, which rejected Calvinist principles. Noyes knew his mother wouldn't be pleased, but he was working hard to establish himself as an independent man. While attending Yale, Noyes wasn't interested in socializing with his fellow wealthy students. He spent his time among less economically advantaged groups of people, including the black community. Noyes felt more connected to God when he worked with disenfranchised people than he did in the academic confines of Yale. But his dogged dedication to school paid off, and in 1833 he earned his preaching license. He delivered his first sermon on August 25, 1833, to a small church in North Salem, New York, that needed a minister. He was nervous, understandable given his lifelong struggle with social anxiety. Yet he arrived at the appointed time, only to find the church completely empty. Noise was beside himself. He couldn't very well preach to an empty church, and there were obviously no phones yet to make a call and ask someone what to do. Eventually, a few congregants arrived and took their seats. Noyes said of his morning sermon, quote, The service dragged, and I was ready to give up in despair. End quote. But Noyes was supposed to preach for the afternoon and evening services. Rather than abandoning his post, he tried to improve his sermon. By the time the evening service rolled around, Noyes didn't feel half bad about how things had gone. He wrote in his diary, quote, for the first time today, I perform the Sabbath duties of a minister. It is wonderful to think how God has strengthened me. A year ago, my nerves were so sensitive and my voice so weak that an evening meeting would spoil me the succeeding day. Now it actually does me good to preach. My nerves are quiet, my voice grows strong by exercise, and I felt better today when I had finished than when I had began. Bless the Lord, O my soul." End quote. 22-year-old Noyes' success at the pulpit in 1833 marked a huge turning point. For the first time, he'd found a place for himself outside of his family. As Noyes continued his studies at Yale, he was plagued by thoughts that he considered sinful. He desperately wanted to find a cure-all that would guarantee his salvation once and for all. At the New Haven Free Church, he explored perfectionism, which he found very appealing. Whalen Smith describes the movement, quote, Perfectionism saw the reform ethos of the American Protestant revival culture and raised it one. The sinner could not only reform himself by making the right moral choices, but also be made perfect, free from sin, simply by accepting God's grace. What mattered was not the letter of the law, but the spirit, not outward acts, but the inward disposition of the heart, end quote. Basically, the idea was that if you accepted God completely and were in step with the Holy Spirit, you were automatically without sin. More conventional theologians thought that this perfectionist belief was both dangerous and heretical. But Noyes came to embrace perfectionism. On February 20th, 1834, 22-year-old Noyes declared that he was, quote, radically perfect, incapable of committing sin, end quote. He further wrote, quote, Three times in quick succession, a stream of eternal love gushed through my heart and rolled back again to its source. Joy unspeakable and full of glory filled my soul. All fear and doubt and condemnation passed away. I knew that my heart was clean and that the Father and the Son had come and made it their abode. End quote. 
According to Louis J. Kern's book, An Ordered Love, Sex Roles and the Sexuality in Victorian Utopias, The Shakers, the Mormons, and the Oneida Community, Noyes' perfectionism had everything to do with his psychological orientation to his family. Kern writes, quote, At the root of this perfectionist theology, with its strident insistence on the worth and infallibility of the individual, was Noyes' uncertain sense of identity, as well as his lifelong struggles for autonomy from his family. This insecure sense of identity also contributed to his desire to avoid emotional dependency on a woman in a sexual relationship. End quote. Despite this, 22-year-old Noyes' first perfectionist convert was a 30-year-old woman named Abigail Merwin. They first connected at the New Haven Free Church and grew increasingly close from February until May of 1834. Noyes soon realized he was in love with her. Noyes was still too scared around women to express his romantic interest, but he wasn't too scared to tell Yale that he intended to graduate as a radical perfectionist. Yale administrators and Dr. Taylor were aghast. In no way did they think anyone was perfect and without sin, particularly not noise. In April of 1834, Yale stripped him of his license to preach and expelled him from the school. After this, his friends and family thought he'd lost his mind. But Noyes was convinced that the persecution he experienced as a Christian perfectionist at Yale was a clear sign he was on the right track. Noyes felt more grounded in his own identity as a preacher and religious thinker than ever, and he'd outgrown his old habit of running home in a pinch. It helped that he knew his family wasn't exactly supportive of his new, radical direction, which allowed him to feel independent of them. New Haven had grown hostile to Noyes, so he needed to go somewhere. He was intrigued by scandalous rumors about perfectionist cults in New York, where they were apparently practicing free love. Members of the free love movement wanted the state and religion to get out of personal affairs such as marriage, divorce, adultery, birth control, and abortion. Their support for sex outside marriage and multiple partners put them in direct opposition to societal norms. Noyes decided to go to the bustling metropolis to investigate these free-love perfectionists. His motivations were purely selfish. He thought the free-love perfectionists' sexual proclivities were ruining his ability to spread his legitimate perfectionist doctrine. Noyes thought he could win the free-love folks over to his thinking, but he was quickly distracted from his original mission. During his first night in a boarding house in Five Points, New York, Noyes had another intense spiritual experience, which he described in highly sexual terms. He said, quote, At one time, the love of the Lamb seemed like celestial fire rushing through every fiber of my body and every susceptibility of my soul. At another, it seemed like a bubbling stream of living water. At another, it was a quite mighty but peaceful river rolling its pure waves through my bosom. At another, it was like an ocean in which I sunk and sunk and found no bottom, and even my spirit mingled with the very essence of the Godhead. End quote. He described his feelings the following morning as, quote, This morning I am sick of love. Now indeed I am married and will henceforth wait only on my husband. I know he will give me all the desire of my heart. End quote. By all accounts, this matrimonial evening was the beginning of a massive breakdown. The DSM-5 describes mania as, quote, a distinct period of abnormally and persistently elevated, expansive or irritable mood, and abnormally and persistently increased goal-directed activity or energy, end quote. George Wallingford Noyes, one of Noyes' descendants, wrote in The Putney Community, quote, He passed through a period of mental turmoil, the purpose of which he believed was to free him from lifelong habits of legality. What he called his unfashionable behavior during this crisis gave rise to the fear, even among his relatives and friends, that he was insane, end quote. By Noyes' own account, he stopped eating and sleeping, wandering five points in a manic state, proselytizing to sex workers, drunks, and sailors. Noyes thought the people he met could escape their plight and improve their lot in life through self-control. 
Ironically, Noyes was exhibiting very little self-control during this period. Noyes was also born with a silver spoon in his mouth. He had no clue about the uphill battle low-income New Yorkers faced, and his preaching fell on deaf ears. But he was relentless and sunk deeper and deeper into his own delusions. He later wrote of that time, quote, I myself was Lucifer, the fallen son of the morning. I submitted to this impression with a struggling resignation to the decree, which doomed me to eternal perdition, end quote. Noyes was particularly disturbed by a vision George Wallingford Noyes describes as a psychopathic symptom. In the vision, Noyes' beloved Abigail Merwin appeared to him as, quote, Satan transformed into an angel of light, end quote. Noyes couldn't reconcile this image with his fond memories of Abigail, and he found himself tormented by this vision. After three tumultuous weeks, Noyes' mind began to calm. He felt that he had walked through fire and come out the other side, truly cleansed of all the temptations of Satan. Abigail's brother-in-law, Everard Benjamin, heard rumors of Noyes' breakdown and brought him by boat back to New Haven. Noyes felt betrayed when he later found out that Abigail was on the same boat, but she had hidden from him. He wrote, quote, her reasons for keeping her presence from my knowledge I never ascertained. The circumstances, however, chimes in suspiciously with the spiritual impressions which I received concerning her in New York, and I began to anticipate the division which followed. End quote. Noise returned to Putney. While he was recovering at home, he learned that Abigail Merwin and her family had left perfectionism. Noyes was deeply torn about his feelings for Abigail. He was still in love with her, but also still preoccupied by the demonic vision of Abigail he had experienced in New York. In July of 1834, Noyes was recuperated enough to put his thoughts of Abigail aside and return to his vocation of spreading his theology. He returned to New Haven to publish a paper with James Boyle, a friend from the Free Church. A theological war of words ensued between Noyes and the New York perfectionists. One popular leader, Simon Lovett, and his female followers took a trip to New Haven to try and show Noyes the light. But after lengthy discussions, somehow Noyes was the one to sway Lovett to his views. In February of 1835, the two men teamed up for a proselytizing mission to Brimfield, Massachusetts. A number of Lovett's female followers joined them. Noyes was shocked to see the women kiss and flirt with the men. And one night, one of the women kissed Noyes. He panicked, unsurprising given his fear of women. The next morning, he got up before everyone else and fled into the freezing cold. He hurried right back to Putney, which was a daunting 60 miles away. In spite of the hard journey, he was glad he left. A few days later, a sex scandal broke out at the revival he'd left, and Lovett and his followers were driven out of town. Noyes was even more certain that Lovett was wrong about the place of sex in life on Earth. That said, Noyes was spending ample amounts of time studying passages of the Bible in an effort to determine what sex was like in heaven. He decided that in heaven, people found spiritual soulmates, and angels enjoyed sex freely. And he realized he wanted to model his new kingdom of God on earth, just like the one in heaven. After he realized he wanted to model his new kingdom of God on earth, just like heaven, John Humphrey Noyes once again became transfixed by another vision of Abigail Merwin in 1835. Wallingford Noyes writes, quote, He saw her clothed in white robes, and by the word of the Lord she was given to him. End quote. Noyes somehow interpreted this vision as God explaining to him how marriage worked on the spiritual plane. He reached out to Abigail and met with her a couple of times to talk about perfectionism. But Abigail's family found out about his antics in New York, and Abigail's father banned Noyes from the house. Noyes wrote to Abigail in an effort to connect, but she didn't write back. In the fall of 1835, Noyes found out that Abigail Merwin was engaged. He was heartbroken. He wrote to Abigail, claiming he didn't want to interfere with her marriage 
but he thought it was important for her to know that in his vision, quote, by the word of the Lord, you were given to me, end quote. In other words, without Abigail's consent, he tried to claim her as his spiritual wife. After Abigail was married in 1837, Noyes heard she'd moved to Ithaca, New York. So he walked 40 miles, quote, for the purpose on the one hand of starting the paper and the kingdom of God in the center of New York State, and on the other, of pursuing and confronting Abigail Merwin, who had deserted her post as my helper, end quote. Abigail's marriage also prompted Noyes to write his infamous battle axe letter to his close friend, David Harrison. Noyes had met Harrison in Meridian when traveling between New Haven and Putney after his New York trip. They'd struck up an intense friendship, and there's some question as to whether the friendship was indicative of a mutual attraction. Noyes had a few extremely close friendships with other men during his early perfectionism, but Harrison was the closest. The two men traveled without Harrison's wife and children to New Haven and spent six weeks living together at a hotel. Noyes wrote of their time together, quote, We perceived much excitement and distress among many who beheld us in these strange circumstances. Many things were said and done to seduce or frighten us from what we knew to be the will of God, end quote. Of his friendship with another young man, Chauncey Dutton, Noyes wrote, quote, our hearts were knit together with a love passing the love of women, end quote. We don't know for sure if Noyes was sexually involved with Harrison or Dutton, but Noyes had great faith in Harrison and entrusted him with his most radical statement to date. In what's called the Battle Axe Letter, Noyes claimed that he would be the leader in establishing the kingdom of God on earth. The letter concluded with some very controversial words, quote, I will write all that is in my heart on one delicate subject, and you may judge for yourself whether it is expedient to show this letter to others. When the will of God is done on earth, as it is in heaven, there will be no marriage. Exclusiveness, jealousy, quarreling have no place at the marriage supper of the Lamb. God has placed a wall of partition between man and woman during the apostasy for good reasons. This partition will be broken down in the resurrection for equally good reasons. But woe to him who abolishes the law of the apostasy before he stands in the holiness of the resurrection. I call a certain woman my wife. She is yours. She is Christ's. And in him, she is the bride of all saints. She is now in the hands of a stranger. And according to my promise to her, I rejoice. My claim upon her cuts directly across the marriage covenant of this world, and God knows the end." end quote. Harrison hung on to the letter for a few months before he felt it had to come to public light. He passed it to Simon Lovett, and it wasn't long before the letter made its way into the hands of Theophilus Ransom Gates, who published it. The battle axe letter was a thinly veiled attempt by Noyes to negate the bonds of Abigail's marriage and claim her for himself, as though she had no say in the matter. We don't know if Abigail ever read his battle axe letter, but it's unlikely she would have been pleased by this public attempt to ruin her marriage. And though we don't know for sure if Abigail reacted negatively, we know the reading public did. Noyes' newspaper readership took a dive. He was broke and on the verge of another mental break when he hit a bit of luck. 28-year-old Harriet Halton, a recent wealthy perfectionist convert who'd sent in donations in the past, sent him $80. It was enough to pay off his debts in Ithaca. Harriet was swept up in the revival movement in 1831 and learned about Noyes' teachings by word of mouth and his own writings. After she sent the $80, Noyes and Harriet continued to correspond, sharing perfectionist ideas. And in the early summer of 1838, Noyes proposed to Harriet by post. Even though Noyes was proposing to Harriet, he was still obsessed with Abigail and wanted to hold out hope that he could be with her. So the wording of his marriage proposal was somewhat unusual. He wrote to her, quote, We are already one with each other and with all saints. This primary and universal union is more radical and, of course, more important than any partial or external partnerships." End quote. 
He continued that he didn't want to, quote, monopolize and enslave her heart or my own, but to enlarge and establish both in the free fellowship of God's universal family, end quote. Noyes was making it very clear that he planned to have other lovers in addition to Harriet. Nonetheless, Harriet responded quickly to his offer with an ardent yes. 26-year-old Noyes had finally mastered his shyness, found an identity outside of his family, and was about to marry well. He was finally ready to move forward with his grand vision. It was time to found God's kingdom on earth. Noyes went back to Putney, eager to recruit new converts and create his community. Noyes' youngest and most impressionable siblings, 15-year-old George Washington Noyes and his sisters Harriet and Charlotte Noyes, looked up to him, and they were easy for him to convert. And he quickly married off his sisters to two other early converts, John Miller and John Skinner, to keep them in the fold. If that sounds disturbingly controlling, just wait, because it's only the tip of the iceberg. Noyes' father was an alcoholic and unreachable, and it's no surprise that Noyes' Calvinist mother, Polly, dug in and refused to convert to Noyes' brand of Christian perfectionism. But Noyes realized he could use his father's alcoholism as a way of proving his mother was in the wrong. According to author Louis J. Kern in his book An Ordered Love, quote, once his decision was made to follow his mother's wishes, rejecting the paternal role model, he readily conceived the idea that his pious mother had sinned greatly in marrying an unbeliever. For, devout as she may have been herself, she connected herself with an ungodly man. End quote. Using arguments like this, Noyes relentlessly pursued his mother's conversion. He turned his younger siblings against her, leaving her feeling isolated and alone. In one manipulative letter to his mother, Noyes asserted that God, quote, has set me to reward you for your care over me by changing places with you and dealing with you as my little daughter. You must expect I shall affectionately reprove you for thinking you know more than your father. I hope you will help your father in these efforts, like a dutiful daughter, and not go about to hinder and vex him, end quote. Noy's manipulative strategy to break Polly worked. When she finally capitulated and offered to convert, she wrote, quote, It was not till after two or three months of entire separation from him and the other children that are at home that I received such evidence that the word of the Lord was in him as to make me willing to become as a child and receive his teaching and instruction and agree to receive him as a guide in spiritual matters. The sufferings and separation which I endured in the time afford abundant evidence, to my own mind at least, that the testimony I give him is not the consequences of parental self-exaltation. This I could not have known if I had not been made to pass through this fiery trial." End quote. In other words, by isolating his mother and convincing her that only he had access to the ultimate truth, Noyes was making use of the same thought reform tactics that cult psychologist Robert Lifton has observed cult leaders utilizing in more recent decades. With this small core group, comprised of his siblings, their spouses, and his mother, Noyes had everything he wanted to confidently expand his flock. And that's when things started to get really disturbing. In part two, we'll investigate how Noyes grew his small group into a 300-member community, and we'll explore how his initial desire to create a sexually open society devolved into an obsession with eugenics and incest. Thanks again for tuning in to Cults. If you want to listen to any previous episodes of Cults, you can find them on Apple Podcasts, TuneIn, Google Play, Stitcher, and Spotify, or on our website, parcast.com, spelled P-A-R-C-A-S-T dot com. If you like what you hear, please leave a five-star review or tell us what you think on social media. We're on Facebook and Instagram as at Parcast and Twitter at Parcast Network. It seems simple, but it really helps our show. Join us next Tuesday as we continue to explore John Humphrey Noyes and the Oneida community with a particular focus on its unusual social structure. 
Cults was created by Max Cutler and is a production of Cutler Media and is part of the Parcast Network. It is produced by Max and Ron Cutler, sound designed by Carrie Murphy, with production assistance by Ron Shapiro and Paul Mahler. Additional production assistance by Maggie Admire, Carly Madden, and Jeanette Manning. Cults is written by M.W. Cartosian Wilson and stars Greg Polson and Vanessa Richardson.